I want to congratulate all of you this morning. You have survived. Not only have you survived all of the family and the food and maybe the football of Thanksgiving, but that more recent phenomenon known as Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, which is known for its big sales, officially kicking off the Christmas shopping season. In fact, many stores uh, are not content to just have Black Friday. They've brought it into Thursday evening uh, to get all of those early shoppers into their stores. This last week, I saw a humorous picture online of a young boy asking, so you're telling me in America, uh, people in America say they're thankful for everything they have, and a couple hours later, they're out in every store buying stuff they don't need? I think that pretty well captures the spirit of Black Friday. To quote one song, we have more than we need, but less than we want. Or, in the timeless words of that Rolling Stones hit, I can't get no satisfaction. It just seems to be uh, an underlying current in our culture. The Christian, however, is called to live by a different standard. We read in Proverbs 19.23, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Luke 3.14, be content with your pay. I can't think of a verse in the Bible more un-American than that. 1 Timothy 6.8, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. In Hebrews 13.5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. You notice the word that is repeated in each one of those verses? Content. The Greek word is archaeo. It appears several times in the New Testament. It means to be sufficient, to be enough. And that goes counterculture in our society where we never have enough. Regardless of how much we have, it's never enough. But that idea of contentment is defined in terms of a general satisfaction with one's state or condition in life, and it produces a pleasing, tranquil state of existence. That is the life we are called as Christians to live. This last week I had the opportunity to listen to a sermon my dad preached a number of years ago called The Contented Life. And he dealt with the passage we're going to be looking at this morning from Philippians chapter 4, where I believe we see the secret to satisfaction. If you want to live a life that is not only satisfying, but satisfied, I believe we can learn how to do that through this passage in Philippians chapter 4. Beginning as we read earlier from verse 10, Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul is winding down his letter to the Philippian church, which many scholars believe was really one long thank you note, and here the apostle really gets to his gratitude. But his appreciation is marked by a little bit of apprehension as well. You'll notice in verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He's not trying to put a guilt trip on them. He's not trying to subtly ask for more. He's saying, I greatly appreciate what you've given. 
how much you've sacrificed. He goes on in the later verses to say, you're the only church that supported me when I was going uh, through Macedonia and into Greece. And the Philippian church was not a wealthy congregation, but they gave generously. And he is certainly thankful for that, but he wants them to know that he's not waiting impatiently for their support. He's not trying to get them to give more. He's saying, I've learned a secret. I've learned how to be content whatever the circumstances. And he learned that by being dependent upon God. And that is really at the core of the satisfied life. He gives us three steps in these verses to the secret of satisfaction. The first is learning of his sufficiency. Notice the term content appears a couple of times here in Philippians, but it's a different Greek word than what usually appears. In fact, this is the only place this Greek word appears. The usual term is archaeo. This is autarkes. Uh, They added a prefix meaning self. And the word can be properly translated self-sufficient. It was a very popular term in Paul's day among the Stoics. In fact, for the Stoics, this was uh, the lifetime achievement that they yearned for. They wanted to be, they wanted to get to a point where they were totally independent of people and things. Nothing would bother them. No one could bother them. Now, their idea of a good life was one in which you didn't have highs and lows. You just kind of stayed at a, a steady emotional state. I'm not sure that's the greatest uh, goal we should shoot for, but that was very popular in Paul's day. They wanted to be independent of of external circumstances, but Paul's self-sufficiency was different than what the Stoics were aiming for. It was a Christ sufficiency. He wasn't depending upon himself. He was depending on Christ, and he found in Christ everything he needed. Christ was enough. He could be independent of his circumstances because he was dependent on Christ. As he wrote in 2 Corinthians 3 verses 4 and 5, such confidence is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. When you first read verse 4, Paul sounds very confident. But this is not arrogance. This is not pride. He is not confident in himself. He finds his competence in Christ. He has found that Christ is enough. Paul was not a victim of circumstances. He was a victor over circumstances. Life's changing situations had no power to touch him. He was content. And I firmly believe that no Christian should ever live under their circumstances. Regardless of how difficult they might be, we are called to rise above. And when we can do that, we will find that while we cannot control our circumstances, neither do our circumstances control us. Paul had learned how to do that. You see, some people are like thermometers. They merely register what is around them. If a situation is tight and pressurized, they register tension and irritability. If it is stormy, they register worry and fear. If it's calm and quiet and comfortable, they register relaxation and peacefulness. But others are like thermostats. They regulate the atmosphere. 
They are the mature change agents who never let the situation dictate their mood. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Now, you might hear that and say, wow, I wish I had that contentment gift. Isn't that one of those ones you talked about in the last few weeks? We're talking about spiritual gifts. Isn't there a gift of contentment that God gives to some people but not to everybody? No, it's not a gift. It's not a spiritual gift like that. It's a learned trait. It's not something that comes easily. It's not something that comes naturally. Twice Paul had to say here, I have learned the secret of being content. It was a process. It's something that took time. And it takes some mental discipline to do it. Contentment doesn't just happen. It has to be learned. You might be tempted to just Chalk it all up to temperament. Well, that's just the way Paul was. Some people are just built that way. That's their personality. They just kind of go with the flow and nothing seems to bother them. But contentment results from an attitude that is learned. It is something that must be deliberately cultivated over time. Attitude governs contentment. And through the power of Christ, Paul had learned to encounter a broad spectrum of situations without letting those circumstances bring him down. Those words, I have learned, are in Greek in such a way that is, I have come to learn, meaning it's a process. Uh, the I here is emphatic. I, for my part, whatever others may feel, I have learned this. And again, it is something uh, that takes time. It's something that you can't read in a book. You can't pray a prayer. You can't just uh, come to a church service and all of a sudden you have it. It's kind of like praying for patience. Have you ever heard somebody say they're praying for patience? I always cringe when I hear someone say they're praying for patience. Because you know how you get patience? You go through problems. So when you're praying for patience, you're really praying for problems, which most people don't want. They just want the patience. <laughs> the same is true here with contentment. The only way we're going to learn to be content is to go through difficult times and discover that Christ is sufficient. He is enough, even when there are things we would like to have that maybe we lack. As Christians, we may start complaining when times are hard, or we may discipline ourselves to be content, reckoning that we have enough no matter what. You no, know, Paul speaks here in relative terms because he knew what it was like to have plenty, but he also knew what it was like to not have much at all. Where he was when he wrote this letter was under house arrest, restricted in his movement, restricted in his ability to acquire things, and yet he could say, I am content in my circumstance. It's a discipline. And I think part of it is a discipline of our mind to realize that we don't have to have what everybody else has. We don't need what the commercials on television tell us we need. We don't have to keep up with the latest and the biggest and the fastest. Be content with what you have. And I know that's tough in our day and age. Our whole economy is based on discontent. Because if everybody suddenly was happy with what they had, where would Black Friday be? Right? Where would Cyber Monday be tomorrow? if everybody was satisfied with what they had. Moving on in verse 12, Paul repeats, I've learned the secret of being content. But he's really not repeating himself. It's a different Greek term here for learned. The King James says, I am instructed. Maybe the uh, most accurate rendering is found in Young's literal translation, I've been initiated. And again, this was a very common idea in Paul's day, you would be initiated into the mysteries of a certain religion. 
He says, I've been initiated into the secret of contentment. The secret of satisfaction I have learned of his sufficiency. A second step in this secret of satisfaction is leaving to his sovereignty. Paul had learned that life is not a series of accidents, it's a series of appointments. He understood that God is in control of this world. And while God does not do everything that happens, is not responsible for every decision that is made, he can still work through his sovereign control so that even mankind's worst choices can be worked out for good. The Bible does not teach fatalism, that our destiny is set in stone and nothing or no one could ever change it. The Bible teaches that there is a God in heaven that rules the universe. In the old days, it was called providence. And I'm not talking about the capital of Rhode Island. It's God's working, his control over his creation. Now, in our day of scientific achievement, we hear less and less about the providence of God. We sometimes get the idea that the world is this vast natural machine that even God himself cannot interrupt the wheels while they are turning. But the word of God clearly teaches that God is sovereign. He does intervene. He does work in his world. Even that word providence comes from two Latin words, pro meaning before and video meaning to see. God can see ahead. He knows what is coming. And not only does he know what is coming, but he is at work to bring about his will. Paul had experienced this divine providence in his own life. And in his ministry, he could write in Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things, God works for the good. It does not say all things work together for good, because not all things are good. But in all things, God works for the good. That's his sovereignty. No circumstance could ever arise that would beat Paul's God. Therefore, no circumstance could arise that would beat Paul because he was leaving his life to the sovereignty of God. Sure, he was doing all that he could to do what he felt was right, but he's leaving the results to God because when it comes right down to it, we make choices, but we don't control the consequences of our choices. Yet God does. And that is where God does his work. He allows people to choose, but he works in the consequences. He works things out according to his perfect will. Even when he didn't see his prayers answered the way he wanted, Paul still saw God's sovereignty at work. We read in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7, to keep me from being conceited, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You notice that phrase? My grace is sufficient for you. In the original Greek, sufficient is archaeo. Content, enough. You can be content with my grace. My grace is enough for you. I ask you this morning, is God's grace enough for your life? Is it enough to get you through whatever circumstance you're going through right now? 
Paul says, God's grace is enough. Even when I don't get that prayer that I'm praying, I'm pleading with God, and he says, my grace is enough. That happens to every one of us at one point or another in our lives. Have we learned the secret of being satisfied? Too often we want to fight against the circumstances we face. We want to do things to manipulate the situation into our, uh, into our favor. Not only is that impossible, because usually our circumstances are outside our control anyway, but it's not even wise. One line that jumped out from my dad's sermon that I listened to this last week, he said, fighting circumstances is fighting God because he is the one controlling our circumstances. How much do we really believe that God is at work? How much do we really trust that God knows what he's doing in the various circumstances we encounter in life? Contentment allows God to be God, to let him work through whatever circumstances we may find ourselves in. And this means we need to be flexible Paul said in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret to be content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. As Chuck Swindoll puts it, in the yo-yo of life, we need to be flexible. (laughs) And it's true, because our circumstances will change. They will change suddenly and unexpectedly. They will sometimes change unfavorably. And we need to be flexible because if we don't, if we're not flexible, we'll snap. And you can take that as literally or as figuratively as you want, but it's going to happen. Paul was, was uh, leaving his life in the sovereignty of God. And then the third step in the secret of satisfaction is leaning on his strength. Here is where we see the famous words of verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I've seen that on signs and on t-shirts and quoted so many times. Yet it's almost always quoted by itself. We need to understand the context in which Paul wrote this. He's saying, I know what it is to have a lot. I know what it is to have little. I've learned to be content. How? Because I'm leaning on the strength Christ provides. He's not saying, I can walk on water. I can fly. I can raise the dead through Christ who strengthens me. He's not speaking of impossibilities here. He's speaking within a context of contentment. He is phrasing this in a context of saying, I have learned to be satisfied where I am in life, which may be even a greater feat than leaping tall buildings in a single bound, or walking on water, or raising the dead. Paul says, I have the strength to do this because God gives it to me. Paul isn't saying he's all-powerful. I've heard some people use this verse almost in an arrogant way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then the focus is on them. He's saying, I can only do this because of Christ who strengthens me. I can only live a contented life because Christ gives me the strength. I like how the Living Bible puts it. I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me strength and power. That's good. It's not saying I have all power. It's saying I can do whatever God wants me to do because he gives me the strength to do it. And the Amplified Bible puts it very simply, which is uncharacteristic for the Amplified Bible, but it says, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That's good. I can be self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency because he is enough. 
Christ is enough to get me through whatever circumstance I find myself in. I have learned to be totally confident that I can cope because of Christ. Now, as you're listening to these words, you may find yourself in a situation that's less than ideal. Life may not only be frustrating and difficult, it may be growing increasingly more miserable by the day. Truth be told, life at this time may be borderline unbearable. And the great temptation is to allow that to embitter you, to, for you to become resentful, to turn into someone who lives under a dark cloud where doom and gloom characterizes your outlook. Life is hard. And if you're not there yet, you either have been or you will be. We are not guaranteed an existence here on earth without difficulties and troubles, without loss. You may live in a situation that may not be literally prison, but you feel like it. You're chained by your past. You're unable to escape restrictive circumstances you're in. And you may have lived this way so long the negative thinking has just become a habit. You can't imagine thinking any other way. But I have good news for you this morning. There is hope. There is hope because of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying he's going to make all your problems go away. I am saying he's going to get you through them. And he will make it such that you can be satisfied even when you don't have everything everybody else has. You may not have everything you want, but you can be satisfied with what he has given you. And when that happens, you're going to see a remarkable change. Your circumstances may not change at all, but you will. Your attitudes will change. Your perspective will change. Your actions, your words will change. And these changes are going to be evident to your spouse, to your children, to your friends, to your co-workers. Instead of seeing yourself as a victim, you will begin to realize a strength that is not your own. And the result of that is going to be that as these people who are watching your life, and trust me, people are watching your life. You may not realize it, but they are. As they see the difference in you, your contentment, despite your circumstances, will be nothing less than heroic in their eyes. And they're going to want what you have. It is a fantastic testimony of Christianity when people go through difficult times and they haven't lost their joy. They haven't lost their peace. They haven't lost their faith. We might think that the world would be impressed by great stories of success. I believe our light shines the brightest in our darkest moments. And when we can learn the secret of a satisfied life when times are tough. That's the greatest testimony we can ever have. And not only will that be a great testimony to others, we will find ourselves less tempted by the materialism of our age. We're going to find that maybe Black Friday and Cyber Monday doesn't quite hold the same appeal to us as it once did because our priorities are different and our perspective is different. The good life only exists when we stop wanting a better one because the itch for things is a virus that drains the soul of contentment. A Christian can live the contented life, the satisfied life, by learning, by leaving, and by leaning, by learning to be content in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, by learning that God's grace is sufficient, by leaving all of our circumstances into God's hands, understanding his sovereignty, leaving our worries at his feet, 
leaning not on our own understanding, but on the strength he provides. This is the secret to satisfaction. And it's something every Christian can attain and learn to become.